say hello. Is it stopping? Oh, yeah, it did. Okay, hello, good morning. Um, my name is Zach Weiland and I'm streaming from my class, DGST 101. I am back to streaming. I had to take some time off, but I'm, um, I'm here now. So hopefully if you're watching, you are in my class. Hopefully if you are in my class, you are watching this either live or after the fact, um, either one is fine. I just see one viewer listed in my dashboard of current viewers. So uh, whoever you are, hello, thanks for watching live. Um, it's always nice to hear who's out there. So if you don't mind saying hi in your either the Twitch chat or the live stream chat, whichever, um, that's fine. But if not, that's fine too. I mean, I just, I'm mainly broadcasting this so that I can um, have a you know a video that I can share later. So there's a lot to cover today and I'm gonna get through it as quickly as I can. There's a lot to cover because I had to not stream or do any video earlier this week. I have, or ha I had, I have, I am, I think I'm, I'm stuck still. Um, I've had COVID. So uh, I've been kind of slowed down because of that. It's, you know, it's a mild case, I suppose, but it's still not great. And also uh, I've been participating in an online conference that is, was in Italy. And so I had been waking up at 2.30 every morning to uh, participate in that in real time with the, the people there. So that was, and that's another reason I'm kind of tired and off, but I'm doing my best and we're gonna get through it. So this is uh, week three, this is day three, but it's really, I'm gonna talk about things that kind of go all through, that cover the content that has already been introduced a bit on days um, one and two, theoretically. No, I'll do that later. Okay, so I have something, I have, a, I have an object here I'm going to uh, talk about. This is my Game Boy. So um, I'm not ready to do that yet though, so let me, uh, talk a bit about the week and kind of where we are, where you should be, uh, and yeah, I mean, as always, if you have any questions while I'm talking, then go ahead and, and let me know. So here we are. So this is the week, and uh, you, you know, I, I I do still think of this in terms of like four days of content, and we are on day three of content. So in terms of what you should have done by now, uh, you should have learned a bit about the life cycle of digital objects. This is our week focusing on the materiality, the material side of digital culture. So you should have played the phone story game. You should have read the story, the, art, the article, your iPhone was made by slaves. That's the excerpt from Kevin Bale's book that's available in, dis, in, uh, in perusal. Um, and then yesterday you should have listened to the podcast about Apple and their labor practices or the labor practices of their supplier, Foxconn. Uh, there's one transcript to read and then one uh, episode to listen to uh, from This American Life. So hopefully you've done that and discussed that. I have seen some activity in Discord, um, but if you're doing that asynchronously on your own time later, that's still okay to do and, and just make sure you add your thoughts uh, accordingly and respond to other people's thoughts if they're already in there by the time you arrive. So today we are, so that's, uh, yeah, again, day one. It was to kind of learn the overall, the big picture using that game, Phone Story. Let me just say a couple things about Phone Story and um, well, not, not much I can show you, but something that some of you may have had a hard time figuring out. I did get a question about this. So you, it does say play it online, but you actually can't play it online anymore. And that's because Flash, the software that is that is programmed in, no longer works in web browsers. There is a big backstory to that, but the basic idea is that you can't just click on it and play it now. Instead, you have to actually download it. And that's easy to do here if you look at these links at the bottom. So there's a version you can download for Mac. There's a version you can download for PC. Uh, unfortunately, if you are you're gonna have a hard time working on this if you have a Chromebook and I don't know a reasonable way to play this on a Chromebook at all unfortunately there may be something there may be something somebody's developed some kind of third-party emulator at this point that that's the kind of thing that it seems like there should there's a need for that but I don't know if that's I don't know if one I have, I've looked a bit and haven't found one if you do find one let me know uh, because I'd love to have that as a resource uh, si similarly if your primary way of accessing this is on your phone you're gonna have a hard time uh, if you do want to do it on your phone, the easiest way to do it on your phone if you have an Android is to uh, you know, pay for it. Um, you can pay $1.99 and, and play it in just like an app. Um, but if you, you know, I understand if you don't want to do that. Uh, if, so I will say as a last resort, so if you are a student in this class, I do want you to experience this content uh, on your own. I do want you to play this game because this is uh, an experiential kind of rhetoric. Like you're supposed to, you are you're going to get the point better if you are the one making the choices and performing the actions that this game asks you to do. If you watch someone else do that, you won't get the same experience of it. So I, I don't really want you to look for 
people do, playing through this on YouTube, but it does exist. And if you've tried everything else and you can't think of anything else to work, then I guess that's better than nothing. But it's only like like slightly better than nothing. So um, really uh, tr do your best to figure out how to play this on your computer. And if you can't, ask me first. Like ask me before you decide, oh, I'm just gonna look it on YouTube. Like ask me and I can probably help you figure it out. The only thing I know I probably can't figure out for you is a Chromebook. I've, I've not been able to figure that out. Uh, but Macs, PCs, yeah, that, that should work fine. You just need to download it and run that file and it should work. Okay, so do that. Um, and then, uh, oh yeah, then also read about your, uh, your phone made by slaves. Um, okay, so then for day two, then the idea was to look at the uh, the two pieces of uh, content. So let me let me just kind of link to that to show you a bit about um, talk a bit about these. This is uh, two episodes of the podcast, This American Life, um, and you can first of all you have to read the transcript for this one. This is because there it's no longer available. Um, they've taken this. They've retracted this episode. Um, but it does still exist. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's Mike Daisy Goes to China. You can click on it there. Uh, I forget always how to find the transcripts on here, but they are on here. Um, act one. I remember I saw someone had a question too. I'm trying to figure out how do we find this. Oh, maybe it's... This uh, week on This American Life, Mike Daisy was on an Apple computer fan site and read about okay. a guy who bought yeah, an so iPhone, you, so, yeah, and it wasn't you, blank. It I'm had information here, um, on it from inside the factory. This takes me in to fact, oh, yeah, in a actually, camera the link roll, here should be, there were pictures. Yeah, so it should be thisamericanlife.org slash 454 slash transcript. So this is the transcript right here. I wonder if my link is... I wonder if I can just... Um, I'm going to change this link to link directly to the transcript to make that easier. You don't have to worry about finding it. Um, yeah, and this one, uh, there is a story about why it was retracted. And I, I think that story is interesting because it has to do with uh, journalism and how journalism is conducted and the sort of the, the ethics of journalism, which is something that the first story didn't account for very well. And so that's that's why this retraction exists. And it's uh, important to do that. But in order to, in order to understand what's being, what is being uh, debated in the retraction episode, you have to read the first one. Uh, so you have that context. And then you do hear a, quite a bit of it in the retraction episode, actually. But I really want you to listen to this episode. Um, you know, one of the kind of secret goals of this week, and this is something that's not like labeled or, or really a high level learning goal, but it is kind of a secret learning goal for this week, is to think about how different media communicate information and persuasive information in different w ways. Um, so for, the, for day one, you read an essay and played a video game. Um, and as I hope you notice when you just when you think about that game, it tries to teach you something using gameplay mechanics. So that's something that you may not have noticed or thought about before. So the idea of that game is to introduce that to you in addition to the content that it introduces. Similarly, on day two, my hope is that you'll think about how audio can communicate information and persuasively uh, communicate information sometimes. And I think you hear Mr. Daisy, Mike Daisy, being very... Um, persuasive in a certain way in the way he talks, but there's also, there's a couple of really interesting moments in the way that this retraction episode is edited. And I really want you to listen to it in order to um, experience that. W one thing in particular is a, a several long, awkward pauses in the conversation. So blank space in the recording that I think are incredibly uh, powerful and and uncomfortable, and I, I really find that interesting. That that this is something they do here. Typically, for radio for audio media, like dead air is like the enemy. Like silence is the enemy. But this is silence used really, really effectively. So I really recommend you listen to this and experience it in all of its cringy awfulness, <laughs> because that's really what it is. Uh, okay, so that's um, day two. So today, then the uh, the content to learn about a bit more about the, the life cycle of these things uh, for their, for day three is uh, to think about the, the uh, so the first day looks at the labor of uh, extracting the minerals. The second day looked at um, labor of producing it. And now for today, we're going to look at the future. So the afterlife, the, the part of your object's life that comes next. And for this, there are two pieces of film, two documentary videos that are 
talking about the same thing basically, but in different ways and using different rhetorical appeals. And I'm interested in that. So th again, this is that secret learning goal for the week, thinking about how different media make different kind of rhetorical appeals. This is another chance to think about that. And uh, we've got two things to look at. The first is, these are both on YouTube. So you this is a, a, uh, a PBS NewsHour, you know, it's the NewsHour. And so this is like a segment on, on the NewsHour, but it's also, it's constructed like a short documentary. And it's a story about what really happens to your recycled e-waste. This is from 2016, I guess. Um, then this is a film from 2012, and this is a, a very different approach. It's slightly longer, um, but you should watch the whole thing. And it's uh, compelling, I think, um, but compelling for different reasons. And that's the main thing I want you to notice is that for the, um, yeah, they're different. And so I've got a link here that explains the different kinds of uh, rhetorical appeals that are available. This is, I mean, the, the study of rhetoric is an entire academic discipline and, and you can take many different courses on it. I don't mean to kind of gloss over that exactly, but here's a quick Wikipedia article that kind of breaks down some of the basic things that you're appealing to. So uh, you, you can appeal to ethos, which would be appeal to the authority or the credibility of the person talking. Um, so after you've looked at these two, which do you think is doing that? Um, you can also appeal to emotions. After you've looked at these two films, which of these two is appealing to those emotions? Um, you can also look at um, Logos, which has to do with the logic of it. I, I don't know that Logos and Kairos are going to be that relevant here, but if you see some application of it, that's great. Uh, mainly, you know, ethos versus pathos would be a great, I, I think that'll be the most immediate distinction you'll be able to make between those two. So I'm interested in um, what you think about that and how, how well these films do each of those respectively. Okay, so that's the kind of thing I'd like for you to do. And also, as you do that, think about, um, you know, I kind of like to do this. So uh, for when we're talking about film, one way to respond to it is to, uh, you know, break it down a bit. And often a way to break it down is to turn some part of it into a GIF. So I've got a suggestion here in the assignment notes for today. And I've also, um, I've got a, I think I have a slide about that. I don't remember. But the, um, still a little foggy here, but, um, Imager is a one of many different websites you can use to convert or to to clip a GIF out of a video. So what you do is you copy the URL like this, and paste it in right here, and then you submit it. And um, it, it it's not foolproof. Sometimes it doesn't work, but what it does basically is it pulls up the entire film here, and then you can kind of scroll to a particular point that you're interested in, and uh, make a, a GIF out of it. Um, you know, obviously this is. You know, just a random moment that I skimmed to. Uh, but if there's some particular moment that you found interesting, um, emotionally effective, or, you know, whatever, like whatever response you want to ha uh, have to this, uh, once you find a spot, hit create a GIF. I just picked a random spot, I guess. And there's a few more steps after this. Um, and then, but eventually you'll end up with a GIF. And you can share that in Discord to, um, to share, with other, share with other people what you thought about that particular moment and why you chose that moment. Okay, so uh, that's and then tomorrow we're going to talk about kind of completing the object lesson assignment. Um, in terms of that kind of nuts and bolts stuff today, I'm going to be mainly talking about the research side of it, and then tomorrow I'll be talking about the presentation side of it. So I'm going to save some of that till tomorrow, but I will introduce a bit about the platform uh, that you're going to be using to share your work. Okay, lots of stuff here. So yeah, um, let me just kind of move through this. Okay, so, um, well, okay, I guess I already had a slide for this. So here's your, here are your two, two videos to watch. Um, I've got them embedded in here. There's no need to really pull them up here. Um, but they're, they're both fairly short, so I, I expect you should be able to watch both of them um, efficiently. You buy a new uh, smartphone or... In the browser. I don't know why Slides does that. Like, why would I ever want to do that? Uh, okay, so again, yeah, breaking these things down, here are some things you might notice about these. I've given you some, some, some suggestions, but these are incomplete lists because I want you to think about it as well. So, um, and in, in this case, I'm not even using technical language, really. I'm just kind of noticing these things, that the it's introduced with a narrator who explains things. There's a reporter. Uh, I mean, there's a host, and there's a reporter, and then there's an expert, uh, several experts, I guess. Uh, for eWasteland, there's not. So what difference does that make? Uh, I think it makes a really big difference. So that's the kind of thing there uh, that I think connects it to appealing to uh, emotion. Anyway, these are things you can talk about in the Discuss eWaste channel, or if you want to make a blog post responding to it, that would be great too. Um, a lot of people, I will say, a lot of students have found these two, especially eWasteland, pretty striking, pretty compelling emotionally, and they have a lot to say about it. So if that's something that you want to write about in a blog post, that's always great. That's always a fine alternative to using Discord. 
Okay, yeah, then I just have a couple of explanations here about this here. Uh, the, the tool using uh, the imager.com slash vidgif. Uh, other websites that make GIFs have tools like this, Giphy, G-I-P-H-Y, Giphy.com, they have one. Um, but at least last time I tried to use it, there's a, the, the video that you load from YouTube has to be like 10 minutes or less, or so there's some time limit. And since eWasteland is 20 minutes, then it, it didn't work on that one. So, you know, your mileage will vary with any of these tools. If you have an issue with one or you find a better one that works, then let us know in Discord. Okay, let's talk about the object lesson project. Now, I've got an assignment description, of course, in Canvas. This assignment description is kind of lengthy because I'm trying to, I'm, I'm kind of teaching the content of what you're, you should be learning as you work on this in the assignment description. So there's quite a bit here. Um, and so I'm not gonna go through the text here. I'm gonna go through some slides that cover the same kind of thing. Um, just a couple of notes here. If you are looking for a device, like your first step is going to be to choose a device. Um, and so you do need to make a good choice about this. Um, and if you want some advice about it, if you have a particular object, you're not sure if it's a good object or not, let me know, uh, let, give, me, uh, give me a chance to give you some feedback on it. Um, I will say generally the older the better because if it's older, it's gonna be easier to take apart. Um, a lot of times students have an old smartphone or you may have a, a drawer full of old, phone, old phones or something. And you might think, okay, these are, I don't need these, let me just take one of these apart. Um, that is possible then you can do okay with the assignment if you're doing that the issue with those there, there are a couple issues with those one is that they're they're very small and so they're hard to take apart safely uh, you usually need special tools those special tools are pretty easy to come by but like you can usually get like a like a smartphone repair kit is usually what they call it um, for like five dollars uh, at home depot or something but unless you already have that you'd have to go get it and deal with that um, the other thing too is like sometimes they have glass and it's if you're if you've already got a broken screen like that's why it's in that drawer uh, it's very you, you know you got to be careful with that glass you might need to take that glass off in order to get to the insides the interesting parts on the insides and I don't really want you, I don't want you to do that the other more uh, dangerous thing with smartphones is if they have a lithium battery and you poke a hole in that lithium battery you can uh, cause a fire so I really don't recommend that either um, obviously those are all kind of things so Ideally, you want something, again, that you can take apart and that you can take apart safely. So that's why I've got some things kind of scrolling through here that I think are good suggestions. Um, I happen to have with me today my, my Game Boy. And so I'm going to show you a couple of things about taking this apart. Uh, if you don't have a Game Boy, that's understandable. These are, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if these are collector's items yet, except, I mean, it's I think it's an antique technically. Um, this, the, the Game Boy, this is the 1989 Game Boy. So the original Game Boy, this one, I believe I acquired in 91 or 92, but this is mine and I've taken it apart, put it back together a few times. So I'm not too worried about that. But, um, as you can see, it's got Pokemon in it right now. I was too old for Pokemon when it first came out and I have Pokemon Blue, um, for some reason, but my, uh, my kids are obviously, they, they really like it. So. They play this game a lot on, on this Game Boy. Okay, so I've got a, it's got a lot of screws to loosen, so I'm just kind of doing that. I'm starting starting that process a little bit while I'm still talking. Um, but if you have a, like a newer Game Boy, maybe um, that's okay. Uh, Discman things are good like that. Um, I've got uh, you know various game related things here. VCRs are okay. The, the issue with the issue with VCRs is they are hard to put put they are hard to put back together. Um, they have a lot of moving parts and gears in them, so it's really kind of hard to get those teeth back together. Also, all those moving parts will have grease on them, so if you take it apart, you, you will get grease on you, so you need to wear gloves uh, to do that safely. The, the big warning, and this is the main thing, is don't take apart anything that has a CRT screen in it. And you probably don't have things like that anymore. I mean, those are harder. I mean, those are rare, but uh, if you have like an old Mac computer, let's say, or if you have like have a Vectrex game system, it's in... Where is it? It's around here somewhere. Those have built-in CRTs, and those are those can be very dangerous um, to deal with at all. Like if you poke it in the wrong place, it could electrify you, and they could be fatal even. So, don't uh, even if it's not plugged in. <laughs> so, uh, please be, don't don't take apart anything with a screen like that. Um, really, yeah. If you have any questions about your device or any hesitation about it, then run it by me, and I, I'm glad to advise. Okay, so here's what we're doing with this. Uh, you are going to be 
learning about the three learning about three phases of this object's life. So there's a prehistory, which I think of as the time before you owned this device. I think of the lived history, which is what what you do with it as as you have it. Um, and then the part three is the afterlife, which is what happens after you no longer need it, after you're done with it. So um, the amount of time you spend on each of these is going to vary. So as I explain this, there are lots of like, if this, then that kind of explanations, because there's just so many different choices and options. Um, but if you think about a, an object that you actually own, the prehistory can be pretty interesting to learn about. The lived history is something you already just know because you have it, like you remember it, hopefully, or you can like ask around or look up dates of things or whatever. Um, and then the afterlife, either way, is going to be speculative, but it's going to be something that you have some educated guesses that you can make, and I'm going to talk about how to do that. Um, ultimately, you're trying to come up with around 15 events, and that's what each of the findings are going to be characterized as, as an event. So there's an asterisk next to 15. Um, 15 is not like a hard minimum and you fail if you don't get 15. I'm just saying that's what you should shoot for. And so that's going to be a handful of e events from each of these life cycles. But my assumption is that you'll spend a lot more time on one of these. And um, which one that is depends on your device, depends on your interest, depends on what you find when you start doing this research. So I, I'm not going to say which it, it ha has to be, um, but y you should just kind of think about 15 as being like, that's when I'm, I'm that's when I'm done, basically. Think about that. Uh, and when I think about an event, you know, again, our idea here is to learn about this device, not the Game Boy as a product by Nintendo, but this Game Boy as the one I had when I was 12. So this is how we get there is by getting really specific with the events that we, we know about this. So I'm thinking when I, when I think about when I'm thinking like year, month, down to the day, if you can, uh, maybe even the time in some cases, but as specific as possible, like for each event, as narrowly as possible as you can define that. So don't say sometime in the 1980s or sometime in 27, well, if the best you can say is sometime in 2017, you know, that's better than nothing. But ideally, you want to try to get down to uh, the month of the year. And that's usually possible. And I'll show you what I mean um, when I get to that step. Uh, and then also you want to figure out the, the street, like the location where this event happened. So when you're looking at the prehistory, the steps, the events you're mostly going to be talking about are the assembly of the different, the, the assembly dates of the specific individual components that make up the device. Those will be different. And you can often figure it out down to the level of street address uh, and even pull it up on Google Maps of, of where this particular fabrication uh, happened. So make sure you uh, you do that as, as much as you can. So don't just say something like, oh, it's somewhere in Asia, right? Because that's not very specific. And there are lots of places in Asia. Also, lots of these things are not made in Asia. So, you know, there are, of course, manufacturing uh, well-established manufacturing facilities in Asia and different Asian countries, but there are different countries in Asia and they have different manufacturers in, involved in those. So these are things that I expect you to be as specific as possible. Um, and, you know, as we get into that kind of research, by the way, just uh, the one, one thing to note is uh, I, I don't know about your device. So when you're doing this investigation, you're going to be making the case that this is the best information you could find about this. And I'm not really going to be able to say like, well, actually, here's this other thing. Actually, this this facility is somewhere else. Um, I, I might know those things. I probably don't. So I'm really, um, I mean, I, I've called this research. This is more of an investigation. Like you're doing this, you're kind of going into primary sources and documents in some cases to figure out like, when did this thing happen? And where did it come from? Uh, so yeah, uh, th that's like, like, as long as you can convince me that you've done your best, uh, then that's good enough. Now, if you do something and you say that's my best, but then I show you like, well, why didn't you do what you know, did you actually Google it? For example, like there are sometimes next steps that I, that I know about that I can say you should have done, but, uh, mostly I, I trust you to tell me what you've, what you've done and what you think the best information is. Okay. So, uh, again, so looking at the steps here. So step one, remember, was choose the object. Step two, start doing the investigations. And then ultimately, you're going to start document. You have to document your uh, your findings. So let's look at what those findings would look like uh, for those different phases. So remember, there's the three phases, prehistory, lived history, afterlife. For a prehistory event, you might be able to say something as specific as this, that this was... Okay, interesting. I have a different... I have... 
different information about this particular chip in that picture. I don't think this is correct for this chip. Anyway, the, um, I will show you that in a minute. Uh, but the this is what you want to know about it, which is when was this chip assembled? When where was it assembled? And you know what actually is it? So that's the idea. And again, you want to get it, get several of these. The amount, the number of these is going to vary depending on what you actually have when you open up your device. So um, several would be great. Three, four, five would be great. Um, okay, so then the, uh, if you're looking at the lived history, so this is where you, these things actually happen. So, um, again, we're looking for an event. So, December, I've picked a date here, December 25th, 2011. I'm kind of making up a story here for this particular object. This is a Guitar Hero 2 controller. And uh, in this case, you know, this is your life. You know these things. I don't know these things. So, you just have to convince me and, and, and be as honest, I guess, and as specific as possible. Uh, when you tell me these things. Now, one thing, you notice I've got these GPS coordinates here. I don't actually remember what those G GPS coordinates point to. Um, since you will be making this public, if you would rather not include the latitude and longitude position of the home where you grew up, I, I understand that. And so if you just want to say generically, like my mom's house or something like that, that would be fine. Um, but this is the um, this is the level of specificity that I, I want you to think about. It's like a specific event, not just like, well, I, I had it for a while and I played it, but like, here's a time when I played it. Here's something I remember with this particular thing. So this thing, you know, this is a pretty old thing, but I still remember pretty specific things. Um, I, I don't remember like the exact date off the top of my head, but I could guess and I could I could pick a, a, pl a plausible date for my, for my timeline. Like I remember going on a long uh, road trip when I was 12 or 13, I must've been 12. Um, and you know i had just gotten this so that's kind of how i remember when i got this and i had just gotten a game called boxel and i remember playing it in the that car as we drove from uh, knoxville tennessee to charleston south carolina and i played it pretty much the whole time so it's it's something that can be done that's the kind of thing that i'd like for you to try to uh, come up with about your uh, object okay so then finally the afterlife this is a um, yeah, I mean, this is going to be some educated guesswork and I've, you know, you can be very, you can be pretty creative with this. Um, one of the things you're going to be aware of as you do this is the different, excuse me, the different materials. Um, so if you're thinking about this device ending up in a landfill, let's say that's the future you imagine for it, then you can be specific well, within some reasonability uh, about like what's going to happen to the different parts of it over time as they break down into their their uh, raw materials back down into their raw materials and uh, this was where you can look up like you can figure out what kind of plastic is it made out of what is the you know the life cycle of these this kind of plastic and you may find that it's thirty thousand years or something um, but that's something you can put on a timeline like you can say like this is july 1st and i've, I've done that here so this is july 1st i don't know that's in 500 what year would that be 500 50 billion, I don't know. I can't really read the number of zeros there, but that's the kind of thing that you can you can guess about and that's fine. To, obviously, we, we won't be around then, so uh, I won't be there to verify whether or not your Game Boy still exists. I just realized the screen's missing. There's, there's, a, there's a screen cover that's supposed to be on this. Like it's a thin piece of plastic, but it has the, the branding on it. I need to find that, okay. Um, my kids play with this a lot. Okay, so thinking about the what this starts to look like when you put it together on a timeline, remember, I, I assume that you're going to probably focus on one of these three more than the other three, um, but all three need to be represented somehow. Here's how it might look if you're focusing on the prehistory. You notice I'm using color codes here just to show you that you would still include events for the lived history and the afterlife, but you would include more events for the prehistory, and that's okay. Um, similarly, for the lived history, you definitely still need to include some prehistory. You still need to include some afterlife, at least one of each. But you've got, uh, you know, you can spend more on the time on the lived history if you'd like. Um, and then finally, the if you just focus on the afterlife, same kind of thing. You need to include at least one event from the prehistory, one event from the lived history, and then you can do more from from the other ones. Okay, let's talk about taking this thing apart and what you're looking for when you do this. So I'm going to start doing this here. I've got a few more, a few more screws to go. Um, so Game Boys are ah, Nintendo devices, obviously, and Nintendo devices have a special set of screws and things that you need. I'm going to try to do this without losing any of them. 
I, I won't, you won't be able to see if I hold this up on the camera, but these are, this is a tri-wing screwdriver. And that's, it's kind of like, you can imagine how a Phillips head screw looks. It's got kind of four, it's like a plus sign. So it's got like little grooves or channels going off in four directions. The tri-wing is like that, but three. So it's like three of these things. I call it a tri-wing. I don't know if that's the right, the technical term. And these are tiny screws. So they're kind of hard to get out. Come on. So, there it goes. I thought I had it loosened all the way. It just wasn't sliding out. Oh, I've got three people online now. I hope you're enjoying me unscrew this. <laughs> all right. So, of course, if you have... Um, three, four, okay. If you're doing any kind of work on small electronics, you need to think about how you set up your space. I didn't really think ahead too much here, but it's nice to have some kind of mat or something that's like spreading, that lets you spread stuff out. Uh, and then also like little cups, like just little paper cups or something are good for holding your screws. And if you have different kinds of screws, you, you I recommend putting them in different cups. Kind of common sense, but it's something you don't, think about until it's too late sometimes when you when you've got it you got a pile of screws and you don't remember where things came from so I'll show you this whenever I get this done okay I think this is the last screw for this part and this is probably all I need to undo for today um, yeah, okay. Okay, cool. So I'm going to just kind of hold this up here. I, this, this opens like a clamshell, and I know you can't see it super well, but let me kind of make myself bigger here for a bit, make my camera bigger so I can show these things. Um, yeah, it's pretty interesting on the inside, actually. There's this little ribbon here that's how the imagery gets from the components to the actual screen and you can take this ribbon out if you're really careful I mean it's not I don't think it's that fragile really, but there we go makes it a lot easier to handle all right so ultimately like our goal is we're trying to understand this as a more complicated device than we take it for granted to be which is this is not just some sort of um, single object this is actually an assembly of multiple objects and each of those objects has a material history a history of labor and a history of human involvement in each of those steps uh, one of the interesting things i find about this one and this is this is the case when i took this up apart sorry i'm huge um, i don't know if this will focus on that but that copper plate there which is part of the shielding actually has some fingerprints on it and these are not mine um, i saw those when i took this apart for the first time and so those indicate the record that, or the trace of someone else that has been inside of this device the, the person who or people who uh, manufactured it they i guess weren't wearing gloves and they put this together uh, i can tell in you know 1991 or so and i have no idea how, who that person was but they are a, they are a person they are a specific person and they have a history and a life and um, it has contacted mine in this really you know interesting and kind of intimate way uh, there are other components to this too. The other thing I want you all to learn about is the fact that these are not just single monolithic objects, but they actually have lots of components. So they are, it's an assembly of different components. And each of these components is likely made at a different place then shipped to a single place to be assembled for the final product. And so there's a lot that goes into each of these. Um, I see I actually need a Phillips head screw to get past this, the next point here. So this is the back of it and it's greening out because my green screen it's actually picking up the green here, but there's, this is a printed circuit board and there are several interesting chips on it on the other side. And so I'm, I want to show you those. So I'm going to go get my Phillips head screwdriver and uh, show you that. There's just to be just two screws to, to do. I'll be right back.
Okay, I'm back. So, yeah, I should have just brought my whole toolkit out here. I have a little toolbox of all the little electronics-related tools. Um, if you do want to work on a smartphone, by the way, like I said, you can get different kits, and there's a couple of different, like, electronic repair kits that I've used that I like, and mainly they just have, like, lots of different kinds of screw heads. Oh, this one's stripped. Oh, dang it. I should get a bigger... I need to get a bigger screwdriver. Um, this, this screw has been, I must have, I must have done this before with this one because this one's, this is going to strip that out. So, okay, I'm gonna go get the bigger screwdriver. Um, but yeah, I was saying there's different kits and I'll show you, I'll go, I'll bring my whole kit back when I come, when I come back. <coughs> All right, I'm back. I, I can't find uh, my my kit. Um, my son has been interested in this kind of thing, so he may have borrowed it. Uh, but I did find a screwdriver that seems to be working. It's one of these these big fat boy guys. Uh, it works well though. For it's got a sharp enough point. So okay, this part I have to be careful about. Um, the uh, yeah the power button um, falls off on these sometimes uh, that's okay so let's see if I can yeah yeah okay so here's the good stuff so there's what I'm looking for these are a number of uh, integrated circuits microchips whatever you want to call them the black rectangles and I know that it's sort of hard to see here let me just kind of uh, as you can see, hopefully, there is some writing on these. This is a, a green square printed circuit board, and then there are three relatively large chips that have uh, text printed on them. And that's what I'm going to be using to investigate. Uh, that's what you will need for yours if you're trying to investigate their origins. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I've done this before for these, so I know these already, but the it's mainly the CPU. Uh, and then there is, I think the other two are like memory. So it's uh, pretty th things you might expect here, but uh, pretty cool to look at and try to figure out where these individual things came from, when and where they were manufactured. Uh, and they were, it turns out, manufactured um, relatively close to the assembly date for this object, but it certainly predated the Game Boy as an object um, by a few uh, months or years. So yeah, that's the kind of thing. You're, you're trying to understand a more complex history of what you're looking for. So I have some slides. Oh, I'm still huge. Hang on. <laughs> I have some slides that will show you the kind of information you're looking for in some more detail um, so i don't have to like hold it up towards the camera here um, this is an example of what you'll see and this is an example of how hard it is sometimes to figure out what's going on with this based on the writing so this is a chip i think this was from a guitar hero controller um, but I, this is a an example of a chip that i was not able to find out much about because there's just not that much information on it like there's not just not, not much information visually there 
remember you're looking for where when and what and so there are some things you can use if you have something that's a, a large enough chip that has enough information on it that you can use and that's again another suggestion that sometimes smartphones are harder to work with because the chips are very small in a lot of cases and don't, there's not a lot of room for writing if there is writing it's often very very small writing and so you need a magnifying glass literally to look at it sometimes so you know these are things where your mileage will vary as i always say but I want to show you how I was able to figure out some things just this morning based on this chip and show you how you can do this research yourself if you get to this point uh, in your prehistory investigation. So here's a chip. I don't remember what this, I think this was from the Guitar Hero controller. I don't remember. Um, but I took a picture of it. You should take a picture of each component that you investigate. And um, yeah, so we can learn, to, we can look at it a little bit here just to kind of just make some general observations before going into some detail about it. Um, it's got this sort of yellow blob, some kind of marker maybe, or some kind of putty. Um, it's got sort of like what looks like a crayon mark. Um, those might be quality control steps at some point. There might have been someone whose job it was to make sure it worked, and so they wrote this or, or, or drew this on there to mark that it was working, or maybe that it was, you know, something else. Um, yeah, yeah. So good, good suggestion there from Picarito in the chat. Like, yeah, the, the, if you were looking at a device like a Game Boy, it's popular enough that people have done this already with much better cameras and equipment than I have. And so you can find a lot of really good stuff doing that. Um, now, I mean, for this project, you should still try to learn about the chips on your specific device. But you know, those YouTube videos can be really helpful to show you how to get to those particular things. Um, and you'll, you know, you can also find actually you know, websites where people have just listed all of the details of each of the chips for their uh, Game Boys, and it's pretty interesting. Um, but a Game Boy being a very popular device means a lot of people are interested in this history. Uh, you may have a device that's not super popular, and so it might not be as interesting, and might not may, there might not be as much of that. But definitely a lot of really good YouTube videos on tearing things down. Um, okay, so let's start looking at some of the things that are here that we can learn about. The uh, first one, the, a, a good one to start with is the manufacturer logo. This is the one in the top, in this case it's in the top left. This is gonna be a little picture, a little pictogram, a little logo of some sort, and this is gonna identify who made this particular chip. It is not necessarily, and probably is not the same company that made the device. So uh, in other words, this is a Game Boy in my case, and I don't remember where this chip here came from, but um, it's, it, I can tell you, I, I already know this is not, it's not the same company that made the chip. Uh, the way it works is like if you're, let's say you have a game console that you're trying to sell, um, you contract with a company, some other company to make all the chips for you. And those companies make those chips or maybe they already make them. Maybe they already have that kind of chip that you need and they have millions of them already in stock. And so you just buy them from them. Uh, these are separate companies. And so they are going to be different. Uh, so Nintendo does its own or did its own. Uh, maybe they, they probably still do, but they did it, their own uh, fabrication for these I believe for the for the Nintendo CPU, the the Game Boy CPU. Um, the other ones though are made by Sharp Electronics, which is a different company. So, um, yeah. Uh, now this one, always, I mean, the Sharp is easy to tell because for Sharp the logo is literally just the word Sharp, so that's easy. Um, a lot of cases of these logos are just pictures, and unless you know what the picture is or like what the company already is, you can't just Google like like what even is that? Like it's hard to even tell what this is a picture of. Um, so you can't just, there's no text you can enter. I, I tried to reverse image Google search on this just out of curiosity and didn't come up with anything. So that's not likely going to work. What will work usually is instead to find a list. There's a few of these. Um, I think I've listed a link to this one in the assignment description, but you can find others if you just Google like semiconductor logos. And there are different things like this and you literally just have to visually scan it. Just like scroll down until you see what you're looking for. Um, I happen to already know what I'm looking for, so that's easier for me because I've already done this, but um, you just have to go visually line by line basically until you see what you what you want. I mean, sometimes you can type a vague description into Google and you might come up with something that, that's close, um, but it, you, you know that's that's hard to do. It's, it's sort of a luck of the draw kind of thing. Um, I will tell you that one of the some of the ones that are very common that you see Matsushita Panasonic, these M's with squares around them or the kind of stylized triangle, those are very common. You will see a lot of those. Same with Marvel or Marvel. I don't know how you'd say that. Um, Texas Instruments is also very common and also very easy to identify because it is the shape of Texas. Hewlett Packard with the HP, right? These are logos you'll probably recognize from other places. A lot of these though, you probably won't. Um, and one that, and I can tell you, the one that I have here, this is actually, uh, where is it? 
yeah, Cypress. So Cypress Semiconductor. And you can see there's two different options. It's kind of small, but let me zoom in on that. So the one is kind of the, it's like a streaky synth wave kind of sun with a like tree in, in front of it. And that's, um, that's what I have uh, on my chip. So that's, you know, that's the match here. That's this thing, that's, that's this right here. So pretty good. Um, so uh, then the next step is to figure out, okay, what, what is the deal with Cypress Semiconductor? This particular listing has a link to it. And if you click on it, what's interesting is it actually takes you um, to infineon.com, not some other you know, website. And so that's already given me some information here, which is that uh, Cypress, and this is also the case for a lot of older things, is that the companies that made those, they um, change their names, they buy each other out, and so sometimes you'll, you'll find that actually the information about a particular company is not available on their website. They may not have a website anymore, um, but you'll find, you can find information on the website of the company that bought them, in this case, Infineon. So uh, this is pretty good, um, but now that I have a name, I can also just search for it, right? So it's Cypress Semiconductor. And if I do that, um, it turns out they do have, well, actually they do have a website still. And they, they've been bought out, but this is, I mean, this is still their website. Uh, they act, I mean, I, they have a Wikipedia page, so you can learn from this Wikipedia page that they um, sold to, uh, to Infineon in 2020. So they, their information is still up and they still operate. I think they, it looks like they're still operating under the name Cypress, but they are owned by Infineon. Um, but anyway, they've got quite a bit of information about the background here. This is actually really good. I mean, you, this is sort of the uh, striking gold sort of in terms of this kind of investigation. You don't normally get this sort of, uh, this, this much information from Wikipedia about these manufacturers. Um, and when you don't, the thing that you can do instead is look at their websites and then see what they say about themselves on their website. Um, a lot of times they'll tell you about their operations. Remember, our goal is to figure out like, okay, now that I, I kind of know the company that made this, where did they make this? And you can start coming up with that list of places if you look at their list of locations. Um, I'm just looking at their website here, so we'll see what they say. And so yeah, I'm looking at Infineon now. So you notice it took me to the infineon.com and I'm looking for production locations. So this gives me a nice looking map of several production locations. Um, it looks like quite a few in, yeah, Malaysia, Thailand. Okay. And then, um, but also quite a few in the US. So the question though is like Infineon owns other companies. Infineon is a company it's own. So these are not all Cyprus locations. So that's something that I need to do some more research on to figure out. Um, the other thing that is um, excuse me, nice about there being a website here, I mean a Wikipedia page, is that um, it has some links to, it actually talks about their facilities, like their locations. So you can essentially look at the list of locations and do some educated guesswork to kind of narrow it down to like what is the, the likely uh, origin of this particular chip. And here's an interesting Wikipedia article. This is a, what's well, a, it's a list page, it's not an article. This is a list of um, fabrication plants around the world um, for many different companies. So not just Cypress, but it does include Cypress, but as you scroll down, you got tons of stuff here. Um, so there's a pretty good chance that it, if once you figure out the name of yours, your chip manufacturer, you can probably come to this page here and find it. Um, you know, there's, there's a ton. Let me just see if they have like TI. Yeah, so Texas Instruments, right? So that's a big one, obviously, in the US. Um, you've got, um, I mean, Samsung has a bunch, right? So there's a, there's a lot. So you uh, can learn a, a, a tremendous amount here. Um, so let's show you how to do it. So let's, uh, I'm looking for Cypress. So it lists two for Cy Cypress. Um, there is what it calls Skywater technology, um, and it says that's in Minnesota, um, Bloomington, Minnesota. So there's that option. There's also uh, a different one that is now named Infineon in Austin, Texas. So that's I, I have two that I'm I'm pretty confident are possible origins for this, if, and these are both started at the right time. So this one was started in '94, and the other one was '91. Um, this chip I know was made in 2007. Um, 
Now, yeah, I think I think this is a 200 millimeter wafer. That's the other thing you can use to try to figure out which of these is likely, but both of them are capable of producing this kind of chip, I believe, if I'm reading this correctly. So th the next thing you want to do is figure out, okay, where, like where in Austin, Texas, where in, Min in Bloomington, Minnesota, uh, the name of the one in Austin is Fab 25. So let's go to Google Maps and let's go to Austin. And in Austin, Texas, now that we're here on the map, let's search for Fab 25. And there we go, Infineon Technologies. Uh, this is it. And I can kind of just do a couple, a quick kind of sanity check, like, because a lot of times an address will be like an office. So this chip would not have come through an office. It would have come straight out of a fabrication facility, like straight out of a factory. So you need to kind of look at this and make sure it looks like a factory. And I pull up the satellite view here. This definitely looks like a factory. Like it's a big square rectangle. Um, and if you want to get it, this one has street view. So I can go down here and see, okay, does this look like a factory? Yes, this definitely looks like a factory to me. Um, so I feel pretty confident that this is a possible location. And now that I have this exact location, I have the GPS coordinates in the map. I could, I could include this in my timeline. Like this is where it came from. Um, I need to do a little bit more kind of thinking to decide if this is the origin place. So the other one to look at here, I guess, is the, the Minnesota one. Now I do also know Cyprus has facilities in the Philippines and Thailand and other places. So, you know, I, I don't know why those aren't on this list. I don't know for sure that this is a, a complete list. So I would also want to look at some of those too to be before I was very confident in that. Let's take a look at, um, where is it, Bloomington? Bloomington, Minnesota. I don't know anything about Bloomington, Minnesota, but there it is. And the name of this facility is the Minnesota Fab. Okay. Gab, Fab. Um, okay, so Fab Craft, Metal Fabrication, Fabrication Equipment, hmm. Plastics, that doesn't sound right. Yeah, polar Semiconductor, that's interesting. That's a different name, but that did come up. I mean, that is the right kind of thing. Let's just see what this looks like. Um, it's a smaller factory, but it looks like a factory. Yeah, it does look like it could be, it could be manufacturing. It, it definitely looks smaller though. So I am not so sure about this one. Oh, well, if that's, that's big, is that the same facility or is this a different building? This, this, okay, that definitely looks like a factory. So yeah, I, this has a different name, but it is a semiconductor factory in the right city. It could be that they've changed their name since this Wikipedia page was written. You know, this, these are Wikipedia pages and they can certainly change. Oh wait, well, now this one says it's Skywater Technology, which was formerly Cyprus, which was formerly controlled with data, which was formerly VTC. So maybe it's Poland, what is it? Polar, let's see, what was it called, Skywater? Weird name, if you think about it. Sky. What is Skywater? Skywater is cloud. Um, okay, here's, but here's their Skywater technology. Oh, okay, here it is. So this looks like, uh, that looks like another factory. So this could just be the sort of semiconductor side of town. And this is, there we go. That looks like the right thing. And there it is. You can see the Cypress logo right on the building. Oh, great. In fact, you know what's cool, actually? Okay, so. There's the Cypress logo, it's really blurry, but that's the same logo on my chip. And check it out. So the next thing I was gonna show you is the date code. So if you look at the date code here, um, a date code is usually a four digit number, sometimes three digits, sometimes it's four numbers plus some letters. Um, there's a, here's a web page that explains some differences in how to interpret date codes. Um, but the in this case, I'm pretty sure this is the date code for this particular chip because this was a Guitar Hero 2 controller. So I'm pretty sure that this is a year, year, week, week date code, which is the most common. So the first two digits are the uh, le the digits of the year, in this case, 2007, 07, and then 49 would be the 49th week of the year, so December. And that if that's true, if that's 2007, that means that this Google Street View picture was taken just a few weeks before that. And if this is the location where that chip came from, you know, this is like this Google car was 
pretty close to this chip um, <laughs> when it was there. So I've got this interesting little connection possibly. Um, yeah, so that's that's the kind of thing. So let me go back to the date code thing. Like I said, date codes, you, you they're gonna be different. And so the, uh, but the most common is four. So if you see a four digit number, see if it makes sense to think of it as some part of that as the year. Like you'll probably kind of generally know when this thing was made or whatever. So you can usually get an educated guess, right? So that's a, a way you can say, okay, well, 49 doesn't make sense as the year because this is clearly newer than 1949. Um, 07 is a possibility. 07 could also be the month so, or, or the, the week. So you have to kind of look at the information against each other. Um, but there's, in this case, this is pretty easy to infer that that's the, the year. And you can see this is how they're breaking that down uh, on these different chips. So that's the idea for the, the date code. If you come across something you think is a date code, but you're not sure how to interpret it, then um, you know, share it with me or, or use the technical, uh, the, the troubleshooting channel in Discord. I mean, that's something I, I'm happy to help you try to puzzle out. It's kind of a puzzle. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so in figuring out what this is, the, the big number at the top is going to be the useful thing. Those are usually the, uh, the, like the longest number that you see is usually going to be the part number. Um, and there's a difference between a part number and a serial number. A serial number would identify this exact chip. The part number would identify what kind of chip is this. And that's what we're interested in here. Like, what is this thing? Um, and this is probably the only thing we're actually searching for it on Duke, Google or DuckDuckGo will actually yield something. So if you go to web search and you find this, you know, in this case, this worked. I, I just typed those letters and numbers in here and comes up with this thing, um, you know, correctly identifying it as a Cypress Semiconductor product. And then it tells me quite a bit about it. Um, it to mainly, it tells me that this is a USB interface and um, that's kind of all I need to know about it. If you want, there's usually something called a data sheet and you can break it down and you can get a ton of detail about it. Uh, the reason that these kinds of sheets exist is like, let's say you're designing a new kind of controller, like game controller or something, and you need a, uh, you need some kind of controller for the, some kind of internal control for the USB interface for it. You might need a chip like this. And so you would need to shop around to decide which chips do you need that'll fit your specifications. And here's a list of the specifications for this chip. Um, so these kinds of things are easy, relatively easy to find in the sense that people that manufacture chips, companies that manufacture chips, put this information out there for people to find uh, that might need to purchase these chips. So there's a whole kind of marketplace aspect to that. But for this assignment, as long as you're able to name it, that's great. I mean, this is a apparently a low speed USB com like that's that's what this is. So I assume that has to do with how like this is a, I believe this was a Wii controller, so it probably has to do with that interface between the Wii remote and the Guitar Hero controller uh, part of it. So, um, you know, that part, it's hard to say in, in terms of exactly what it's for, but that's fine. We just know that this is a USB uh, controller chip and it was made up by Cypress Technologies, probably in, um, now I don't have, it's hard to say between Minnesota or Texas. Um, you know, that's something I, can, I I'm just gonna make the educated guess and this is, not that educated, I suppose, but I'm going to say it's probably in Minnesota. And then, um, yeah, we'll go from there. Now, whenever you get to these steps, whenever you get to the point where you're feeling that you're at the end of your investigation, like you've got to as far as you think is a reason is reasonable to go, or as far as you can go, you need to document how you know, like, how do I know that that's what I know? And as you can see over here in my browser, I got a bunch of tabs open. And these are the tabs that I used to not that one, but not that one. But uh, these are the tabs. These are the things that I used to find this. So you need to keep track of each of these tabs, each of these URLs where you found something. Uh, if you found something useful here, if you found something useful um, on the uh, on here, copy the URL for this. Keep track of each of these because in your timeline, I want you to show me how do you know these things? Like how do you know, how, why do you feel confident that this is the right um, location or the right time or the right whatever it is? Uh, okay, so that's what you need to do. And uh, I do recommend documenting it. This is just the, an example of how you might want to just record this information for your own purposes. Um, in terms of putting it into the timeline JS structure, you'll be doing other things with this data, but you need to have the data first. So I recommend keeping track of it, some, something like this. Um, so the part number, uh, the description of it, the manufacturer, now that you know that, the, uh, the location, and you can make these things links to those pages where you found that. That's an easy way to keep track of it. Or just make a list of sources, something like that. Um, and this is this is the, uh, how you collect your your work for the findings. You can do this in a Google Sheet if you'd like, or you know, Word document doesn't really matter. Whatever is convenient for you to keep track of this information. 
Okay, that's, that's kind of the investigation part of it. Okay, now um, I've gone on for over an hour, so I'm gonna wrap this up. The thing I will talk about tomorrow is the uh, how you're going to share this, how you're gonna make this information something that other people can learn from. And remember, you've got different kinds of things you're gonna find out that have to do with the, um, pre the prehistory, the lived history, and the afterlife, right? Um, but whatever you've got, you're gonna be putting this into a timeline. And the way that I want you to do this is with something called Timeline JS. Um, I, I want you to do this way because, again, my goal here is specificity. I want you to get as specific as possible, and a timeline is a way to really demonstrate specificity, and you kind of need specificity in order for a timeline to make sense. So that's what I want you to do. Um, Timeline.nightlab.com. Uh, this is a widely used tool for conveying this kind of thing. It's a good thing to have some experience with, um, and it's all accessible through a Google Spreadsheets template. Um, I'll go through the process here just really quickly. You click on this button that says Get Spreadsheet Template, and you literally just you go here and then you make a copy. Um, and this is the part I'll gloss over for now, which is that you fill in the details that you found. And uh, I'm not going to do that now, but this is a, it's got some sample data, so this will at least work. Um, different options, different things you can do with it, but you know, fill in your data, the information about the particular things you discovered here and then uh, test it. And so to test it, what you wanna do is go to file and then publish, where is it? Uh, they, there it is, they've moved this link menu around here. So it's share, publish to the web, and we wanna publish the entire thing. And this just changes the access settings on the document. Um, this gives me this here, but I think I don't need that one. I think I need the other one. So I'm just following the instructions here. So file, publish to the web, and then the next window, hit publish, and then, right, yeah, that's what I thought. You don't get this URL, you get this URL. Whoops, this one, this URL. Um, I don't know why, but that's how Google decides to do it. Google uh, makes unusual decisions about how to access their products, and I, you know, I don't know why. And then paste it in here, and you can set these options, but don't worry about those yet, and those actually, Whatever you paste here actually updates the links and the embed information down here below. So this is actually going to preview, uh, this is giving me a preview of the spreadsheet that I just created. This isn't part of the website. If you like, it's easier to see it in its own window. So I'm gonna open it here. And just to demonstrate that this is actually working, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna make a change here to make sure that it works. So I'll say my spreadsheet example. And then if I reload this page, yeah, now you'll see that it, it applied that change. So th this is a pretty good way to work, I think, actually. Start with it wor a working, like start with a template with working data and then sort of gradually replace it with your actual data. And the, the advantage of doing it gradually is that you'll see if something you do messes it up. So if you add something in here and it doesn't, and it causes a problem, you'll see, you'll know that, oh, that thing that I just did, that was the, that was the problem. So let's say, um, Actually, one of you sent me your timeline earlier today, and so I saw something that I think is going to cause an error. So I'm going to try that. I'm going to try to cause that error now, and then show you how to fix it. So let's say you're just entering these dates off the top of your head, and you put November, right? Um, let's see if that works. Oh, it actually, did it work? Oh, okay, maybe it actually works. I was going to say this. This might because um, like this little warning pops up saying it needs to be a number between one and twelve. Um, maybe it doesn't. Oh, there it goes. Okay, I think it just wasn't updated yet. So I'm getting this here. Invalid date, month, day, and year must be numbers, right? So that's uh, that's what I'm, I think it took it a few seconds to catch up with the, the changes I made to the spreadsheet. So now that I'm here, you can see that, yeah, actually that should be a number, not the word November. And this little tooltip that pops up, I don't know if you can see the tooltip. It might be behind my head, but it says, uh, in fact, the whole the whole row is probably behind my head. Let me, uh, let me move myself over. Here I am. So what I did, I, I, this is... This was an 11, and I changed it to the word November, and that's what produced this error. So if I change that to, you know, 11. That should fix that. Just need to make sure to update it. This is not instantaneous. It's a lag of a few seconds, but that's not too bad. So that's how you fix that error if you get that error. All right, well, I'm gonna wrap things up. Um, I went on a little bit long, but I had a lot to cover, kind of covering essentially three days in one. So that's not bad if you think of it that way. Um, I will be online again tomorrow with the final steps, and I'll spend most of tomorrow talking about how to get the most out of and how to, how to use the Timeline.js tool here to convey your timeline. 
Okay, well, thanks for watching. Um, if you are in the class, uh, you know, whether you're watching this live or after the fact, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, of course, please let me know. Um, you know, I'm always happy to, always happy to help. That's what my job is. Okay, well, I'm going to switch to my outro scene and wish you all a good day. Put the mic off to the side here. All right, that's all for now. Have a good afternoon.